Good morning. The service begins on page 355 of the prayer book. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Blessed be God's kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, whose Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, is the light of the world, grant that your people, illumined by your word and sacraments, may shine with the radiance of Christ's glory, that he may be known, worshipped, and obeyed to the ends of the earth. Through Christ, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. reading from Isaiah. For Zion's sake I will not keep silent, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not rest, until her vindication shines out like the dawn, and her salvation like a burning torch. The nations shall see your vindication, and all the kings your glory, and you shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. You shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. You shall no more be termed forsaken and your land shall no more be termed desolate, but you shall be called my delight is in her and your land married for the Lord delights in you and your land shall be married. For as a young man marries a young woman, so shall your builder marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. The word of the Lord.
A reading from Corinthians. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were enticed and led astray to idols that could not speak. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking by the Spirit of God ever says, let Jesus be cursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of services, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who activates all of them in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the discernment of spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are activated by one and the same Spirit, who allots to each one individually, just as the Spirit chooses. The word of the Lord. All the children are invited to follow the volunteer after the reading of the gospel uh, to go to Children's Chapel. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. On the third day there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now standing there were six stone water jars, for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to them, 
filled the jars with water, and they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. When the steward tasted the water that had become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the steward called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and then the inferior wine, after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs, in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be I speak to you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We are a culture obsessed with weddings. Little girls plan their weddings from the time they can think for themselves. There are television shows, Say Yes to the Dress for Brides and then for Bridesmaids, Bridezilla and Her Mother, Four Weddings in Comparison, I am often overcome with the extravagance and the conflict of weddings. It makes me sad at the emphasis that it's the bride's day and she gets exactly what she wants, whatever she wants, no matter what the groom thinks or the father thinks or what the budget calls for. It makes me sad that the wedding day and all of its hullabaloo take precedence over the friendship for the long haul. Still, I have to admit, it's all very entertaining. Weddings, you know, have drama. It may be between divorced or estranged parents or step-parents or family members who just have to have their own way or who drink too much. It may be in extravagance or fashion or other kinds of spectacle. As the chaplain of a women's university for 24 years, a university that sported a 90-foot center aisle, I officiated lots of weddings. And it is almost certain that every wedding will have some kind of crisis, some part that goes wrong that's very awkward at first and later might just might become a little bit funny. Sometimes it's an oversight in the liturgy itself, like the time the bride's aunt wrote a schmaltzy, wordy litany with terrible theology, and after long weeks of negotiating about whether we would use it, I included it in the service, but then completely forgot and accidentally skipped it in the ceremony. Or the several times I forgot to even invite the couple to kiss each other. Or the time the couple kissed each other every time they completed one portion of the service. (laughs) Other crises have been the grandmother who fell at the rehearsal, breaking her hip and requiring surgery, and a visit by the wedding party in all of our finery to the hospital on the way down to the reception or the time the groom's brother fainted and laid on the chapel floor for so long, even with physicians attending him, that I finally got the organist to play a hymn and slipped out to call 911, who arrived with a stretcher at the recessional. Or the bride who sobbed all the way down that long aisle. Or the day the groom, who was so nervous, was sick all over all of us. 
And then there was the day that the bride just never showed up, and we had to call the whole thing off. It's anybody's guess what might go wrong and how the players might deal with it. Weddings have their drama. I've been pl at plenty of weddings where people drank way too much, but I don't remember any wedding that ever ran out of wine, as occurred in the wedding in Cana where Jesus and his disciples and his mother went to help celebrate. In Palestine of the New Testament times, a wedding was really a very notable occasion, a much-valued break from the relentless toil of a peasant economy, a break from the back-breaking, endless physical labor. For a week, the newly married couple, instead of going away on a honeymoon, kept open house. They wore crowns and dressed in their bridal robes. They were treated like a king and a queen, were actually addressed as royalty, carried around on chairs so their feet would never touch the ground, and their word was law. In communities where there was much poverty, constant hard work, and the ever-present threat of danger, these events were some of the supreme, joyous occasions of life. For the wine to run out was a spoiler for the partygoers, and especially for the hosts of the party. Now, if it were us, we might whisper nervously to some friends and ask them to run to the local wine shop and pick up some more. But in this time and place, running out of wine too early isn't just a little embarrassing. It's a disaster. Wine isn't just a social lubricant. It's a sign of the harvest, of God's abundance, of joy and gladness and hospitality. And so when they run short on wine, they run short on God's blessing. And the wine has run out before the wedding has, and it's a catastrophe. Jesus' mother notices and calls the crisis to his attention before anyone else perceives it. Jesus seems reluctant to, ask, to act yet, as his hour had not yet come. But then she tells the servants to follow his orders, and what is he to do? He is thrust into action. He instructs servants to fill six huge vats of water, 20 to 30 gallons each, to draw some out and to bring it to the chief steward, who declares it the finest of wines. And so the party continues without pause. How's that for a happy ending to the story? and a very happy beginning to a ministry. The joyous feast has been saved by Jesus' first miracle. And perhaps this is the miracle we still need from Jesus today. On the other hand, this is a kind of troublesome miracle to me. There are plenty of other shortages surely more important ones that none of us believes will be solved by a miracle of grace. Take, for example, the fiscal cliff or the national debt, or if we should have a shortfall in our own church budget. Take a worldwide shortage of oil or clean water or medical care. Think of families in this country and other countries where desperate parents say to their children in the evening, we have no food. Or places where children play in bomb craters the size of 30-gallon wine jugs. I think on Martin Luther King weekend of people denied basic civil rights, of blatant or latent racism, of violence all around the world, even between religious communities, and of soldiers returning from war to kill themselves at home in peace. Or of all kinds of people who simply cannot imagine a better life than the one they can barely eke out for themselves right now. 
So while it hardly seems fair to turn a story about divine abundance into a kind of trial of God, God's extravagance in one place makes God's absence in other places stand out. Maybe Jesus says to us again now, the hour has not yet come. No matter how we justify God's activity or lack thereof, we still and I still want to tug at Jesus' sleeve and say, they have no wine. If we believe and trust that God wants abundance for all, then we must follow in the steps of the mother of Jesus by prodding God for compassion and generosity. Is God waiting to see and hear human compassion first as a miracle of itself before the second miracle of grace can occur? God needs the heirs of Jesus' mother to go on prodding divine generosity. That's our role, to ask God over and over and to act in a miraculous compassion and mercy to keep looking for needs to bring God's eye upon. Maybe you think this is backwards theology. Maybe I'm grasping, but God does honor a sometimes quarrelsome protest, a nudge of the divine from the human side. Martin Luther King Jr. was this kind of nudge for us and for God. The text this morning invites us to trust so much in God's generosity and abundance that we, like the mother of Jesus, nudge God in calling out to and articulating God's compassion for those who in their lives have run out of wine too early. This is one way to trust, and there is another. The theologian Jürgen Moltmann, in his book, The Church in the Power of the Spirit, describes Jesus' earthly life as a festal life. His hope is a life of celebration at a very crowded table, not a table where human beings sit to escape from suffering, but a table where outcasts are all included. There is enough for all of us, and the good wine flows abundantly. I think that our church, and that the church in the United States, has forgotten that our Lord once attended a wedding feast and said yes to gladness and joy, and that God loves to hear the laughter of people celebrating other people. Sometimes we have forgotten as Christians to live that joy. The sign of Cana in Galilee tells us that Jesus served a God who put joy into life, who thinks it's worth a miracle to keep a party going as we celebrate people, happiness in life, and the fulfillment of our dreams as every wedding certainly should be. God doesn't want our religion to be too holy to be happy in. Throughout his life and ministry, Jesus celebrated people, people getting married, people being healed of disease and deformity, people enjoying meals together. He carried a festal spirit with him wherever he went as he proclaimed a God of mercy, peace, and joy. The miracle at Cana is still a sign to the church that we are to rejoice in the people of God and to toast the world with the amazing good news of Christ. Some of us may think that with the Christmas decorations taken down and stowed away, that the party is over. University of Chicago theologian Robert Hodgkins said, Christians ought to be celebrating constantly. We ought to give ourselves over to joy, because we have been liberated from the fear of life 
and the fear of death. We ought to attract people to the church quite literally by the fun there is in being Christian. With this as a standard, no wonder that the church in the world is shrinking. Have we forgotten about joy? We need to remember that the mother of Jesus swung into action to keep the party going in Cana, and that her son determined that it was time after all for the water to be turned into wine. This kind of grace, 180 gallons of it, 500 liters of it, 750 bottles in our measurement, six huge vats of wine to the brim, is a miracle of joy, abundance, and God's great glory. What a way to begin a ministry. And just in case you wondered, Jesus is throwing a party here this morning, too, there at the altar, a reminder of the taste of joy that is his spirited life in us. Come and lift up your hearts that labor to bring God's compassion into a hurting world. Come and hold out your hands to receive the miracle of joy that will carry you another day with hope to share. Come to the marriage feast of need and abundance, of compassion and extravagance, of the Savior and the saved. George Bernard Shaw said, life wasn't meant to be easy, my child, but take courage, it can be delightful. We could drink to that. Amen. Let us rise and confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed, written on page 358 in the Book of Common Prayer. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is, seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. (coughs) We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Our service continues with the prayers of the people, found on page 387 in the Book of Common Prayer. In the Anglican cycle of prayer, we pray this morning for the Diocese of Liberia in West Africa. (coughs) In our Diocesan cycle of prayer, we pray for St. Paul's Carey, Chapel of the Cross, Chapel Hill, Church of the Holy Family, Chapel Hill, Church of the Advocate, Chapel Hill, and for the Diocesan Convention and upcoming election of our suffragan bishop. And in our own parish, 
We pray for our 2013 vestry on retreat this weekend and for our incoming diocesan intern, Elaine Tola, who begins her ministry with us next Sunday, January 27th. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church. Grant that every member of the church may truly and humbly serve you. We pray for Rowan, the Archbishop of Canterbury, for Catherine, our presiding bishop, for Michael, Chip, and William, our bishops, and for all bishops, priests, and deacons. <clears throat> we pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake. We pray today for all people involved in conflict and war, especially for Mark McLaughlin, Travis Ramey, Vitaly Jelfest, Stephen Fancy, Peter Miller, Charlie Kirksey, and Chris Strong, and for all others who have requested our prayers, for Barbara Selman, Carol Tuchico, Ray Ladd, Rick Weatherly, Roberta Egedanissen, Olivia Wooden, Judy Schilke, Rebecca Coley, Zora Anderson, Lauren Wilburn, Tommy Shepard, Sue McCrone, Rod Reinecke, John McGinnis, James Bustard, Buster Brown, Connie Molinaro, Jack Foss, Walt Morse, Pat Boyd, Kim Boyd, Ramona Simmons, Steve Hinckley, the Right Reverend Hunt Williams, Mary Price, Margie Wagner, and for all residents at rehabilitation and assisted living facilities and their caregivers. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble. <laughs> and we pray for all who have died the Reverend Dr. Carl Ficken, friend of Cecilia and Bob Walkers, for Agnes Gant Harrison, Anna Rosinall, friend of Stieg Egedenissen, and for those who died in the service of their country, Aaron X. Whitman. Give to the departed eternal rest. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. Let us now pray for our own needs and those of others. Hasten, O Father, the coming of thy kingdom, and grant that we, thy servants, who now live by faith, may with joy behold thy Son at his coming in glorious majesty even Jesus Christ, our only mediator and advocate. Amen. Now turning to page 360 in the Book of Common Prayer, let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. 
and the peace of the Lord be always with you. The party going. Good morning again. Um, as always, we welcome our visitors and newcomers to the service and to the church. I want to remind you that all are welcome uh, to the coffee hour immediately following the service in the parlor. Um, we have an announcement that we want to do first off. I see it happening right down here. Come on forward. This is going to keep the party going, let me promise you this. Thank you. Well, I hope you'll go and get your cookies before I get mine. Um, as you notice, Adam and Marissa are away with the vestry on retreat this weekend um, in St. Francis Springs Prayer Center in Stoneville. We invite you to keep them in your prayers um, as they return this afternoon, that their planning has been very beneficial. Um, I'm sure it will benefit all of us. Um, as you'll note in the bulletin, Holy Comforter is co-sponsoring a film screening with First Presbyterian Church that's going to be shown here at Holy Comforter next Sunday in our auditorium at 6.45, following a six o'clock covered dish dinner in the Great Hall. The film is Brother's Keeper, a locally made film that was released last year, and the filmmaker Cornelius Muller will be with us to speak about the film and answer questions about it. This is a moving film that raises questions about forgiveness, and I hope that you'll be able to come um, to see it. If you're interested in being baptized or confirmed or want to, speak to, uh, want to speak about baptism or even reaffirming your baptismal vows when Bishop Marble visits us on April 14th, please speak to Marissa or Adam um, so that the preparations for those uh, processes may begin at the beginning of Lent. On Saturday, February 2nd at 5 p.m., uh, the choir will lead us in a choral evening service um, in St. Athanasius Chapel in observance of Candlemas. Candlemas uh, occurs 40 days after the birth of Christ and marks the presentation of the infant Christ in the temple. We hope that um, some of you will be able to come. I think that's all of the announcements. Ascribe to the Lord the honor due his name. Bring offerings and come into his... Did you have another one? Oh, uh, stop. Hold the phone. We have another one. I thought that one was yours. We're keeping the party going. We're doing it. Okay, sorry, I'm wearing too many hats today. Um, in three weeks, we will have, uh, Harriet Whitley and I will put together new home gathering groups, dinner groups of eight. So if you're interested in joining, please sign up uh, in the parlor after you've bought your Girl Scout cookies, and I'll put you on the list to, for the reshuffle. Um, if you don't have an opportunity to get to the parlor, just call me, I'm Jocelyn, or Harriet Whitley, or call Jenny at the office and um, become uh, part of that party. Thank you. Ascribe to the Lord the honor due his name. Bring offerings and come into his court.
and all your gifts. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, because in the mystery of the word made flesh, you have caused a new light to shine in our hearts. Give the knowledge of your glory in the face of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. And gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself, and when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim... Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit, to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also, that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace, and that the last day bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, All honor is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, 
and the power and the glory, now and ever. Amen. Alleluia, Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. The gifts of God for the people of God. This is God's table, and all are welcome here. Kurt and Donna to come forward. In the name of this congregation, I send you forth bearing these holy gifts, that those to whom you go may share with us in the communion of Christ's body and blood. We who are many are one body, because we all share one bread, one cup. Kurt and Donna, we send you out to share communion this week with Mary Frances Weldon and Anne Turner. May you carry the prayers of all of us as you take this sacrament of Christ's presence. May those who receive it from you be strengthened and encouraged in that community we have together in our Lord Jesus Christ. Post-communion prayer can be found on page 366 of the Book of Common Prayer. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son, and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. And now may you accept life as a gift, and live life as a way of giving thanks and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be among you now and remain with you always.
point, to love 